Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill and I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. On this episode of the podcast, we'll be discussing a new veterinary organization, the Latin X Veterinary Medical Association. Yay. Uh, as we record this show, protests around the um, world continue in support of social justice for marginalized populations. As a part of the larger conversation around these issues, it is really important um, to periodically revisit the importance of affinity organizations. During times like these, such organizations really do provide both a voice and a safe space for their members um, who may be experiencing um, racialized or other kinds of, of trauma personally, just kind of related to what's going on in society, both personally and professionally. So additionally, these organizations always play an important role in elevating important issues that sometimes larger, more global organizations are unable or sometimes unwilling to take on with respect to diversity and inclusion. So to discuss all of this good stuff um, that Latinx VMA is doing um, and the role that they'll play in veterinary medicine, I am delighted to welcome three guests, Dr. Carlos Campos and DVM students, uh, Juan Hor Orjuela. <laughs> Orjuela, but yeah, perfect. <laughs> right. Okay, and Yvette Huizar. Close enough, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 we're not doing that. It's not close enough. <laughs> like, it's we sad. One more time. We sad. We, we sad. sad. Okay. All right. And and I tell you this, and I say this all the time. Like, if someone mispronounces your name, don't let it go. It is your name. It is your name. And it's a part of like diversity and inclusion. If we can, if y'all can learn all of those complicated veterinary words, you can learn. We can all learn how to pronounce each other's last names, right? So as we dive in, um, we are streaming live on YouTube. Um, the chat is open. Feel free to post a message, a question, um, and we'll try to get those answers. So. Um, with that, why don't we get started? Uh, Carlos, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Dr. Carlos Campos. I'm a University of Florida 2002 grad. Um, I've been now in practice for about 18 years and uh, been involved in organized veteran medicine off and on throughout my career. Uh, I've owned a couple of different hospitals, uh, worked as an associate and relief veterinarian. So I'm hoping to bring a little bit of experience to the uh, executive board at the Latin XVMA um, and uh, obviously help as much as I can. Great, thank you. Yvette, why don't we go to you next? Thank you. I'm Yvette Wiesad, like uh, Lisa said, and I'm a fourth year veteran student at Cornell and co-founder of the Latin X Veterinary Medical Association. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> Um, hi guys, thank you so much for having um, this platform for us. My name is Juan Sebastián Orjuela. I am a third year veterinary student at the Ontario Veterinary College in Canada, and I am also co-founder of the Latinx Veterinary Medical Association at Libya. So thank you guys for joining. Thank you, wonderful. Well, why don't we just dive right on in. So um, Yvette, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Latinx VMA's uh, origin story? Like, how, do, how did we get here? <laughs> yeah, uh, so I was part of Voice at Cornell. I was vice president. And we began having conversations about um, Latinx folks in veterinary medicine, our school, um, clients, and the lack of representation that we see, and how not a lot of people were talking about some of the challenges associated with not having um, bilingual veterinarians. And so we started talking about why there wasn't already an association for Latinx veterinarians like there are for medical doctors, dentists, optometrists, etc. And um, I created like a veterinary associated Instagram to try to connect with other like-minded people and it worked and I found Juancho and yeah we connected through Instagram and um, 
I ended up setting up a meeting with him, myself, and a bunch of other Latinx students at Cornell. And we just started dishing out all of the different initiatives that we wanted to do, how we were going to go about it. And a couple months later, here we are. <laughs> awesome. So, so tell us a little bit more, Wancho, about, you know, your perspective on why there is a need for, for this group. Of course. So like a lot of what you have said is, um, is very, you know, accurate. So we wanted to, we kind of grew up in a, in a place where we didn't have much representation, uh, nobody to look up to, no type of mentorship or anybody that really looked like us in the, in the profession itself. Right. So when we both got to veterinary school, I know when we connected, we talked a lot about this and we were like, okay, there is this huge gap that we need to fill. Um, and create this community. And I, we see a lot of community in, in the Latinx population because we, we're we all linked to one uh, specific language, including Portuguese, uh, it's very <laughs> same, right? So we include uh, Latin America, anybody that really speaks Spanish, um, people from Brazil and Spain, even those that don't speak Spanish and are interested in learning about our culture and stuff. So we saw that gap um, and we just wanted to fill it and provide people like students like us, the opportunity to get that mentorship, get opportunities, um, find scholarships, uh, you know, create our outreach programs that are gonna help the development of our community in the veterinary field, right? Um, so we, we just wanted to uh, create that community and, and provide a, a place or a space for people where they can amplify their voices and and um, and kind of show that there's a lot of Latinx excellence in, in the profession itself. Hey, wonderful. Um, so Carlos, what? how do you feel, what's the role? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, we talk a bit about this um, origin story and kind of what the group is gonna do. And I wanna talk a bit about those pillars in your organizational mission. But uh, um, as, as a practitioner, as someone who's kind of been out there for a while, how do you see this group fitting into, I guess, the landscape of organized veterinary medicine? So what's the role of these affinity groups like? Well, uh, just like Juancho said, it's really given, uh, you know, a subsection of the population a voice uh, and a place for them to be able to see other people and interact with other people and, you know, really even forge maybe, maybe even mentorships. Uh, there is so little access, I mean, from the beginning of, of my career, you know, as a veteran student, for me, to even know anybody that was, you know, from a diversity background uh, in vet school or, or working as a veterinarian, um, you know, it, it was just nothing there. So I think this will fill that massive gap that we have um, to be able to allow in not only vet students, but even, you know, I look at, look at it and even go uh, farther to little kids, you know, someone to look up to. Um, Oh my gosh! I can I can actually be a veterinarian. There's somebody that looks like me who is successful and has done it, you know, and that can be me someday. Uh, you know that that definitely is the place where all of us basically can be in. Mm, great. So so Yvette, tell me about the the mission. And I know that you all have I think it's like four pillars, maybe five. I can't remember. Yeah. But that's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, our mission is to empower Latinx veterinary professionals, so that includes veterinarians, veterinary technicians, and to support students that are trying to pursue careers in veterinary medicine, specifically Latinx students. Um, and so for the empowering portion of the day, we came up with four pillars that we felt really tackled um, all the different things that we're trying to achieve, and that includes professional development, creating networking opportunities um, within the veterinary community, um, mentorship for students, and that's both within veterinary schools themselves, like first years with third years, and also with veterinary professionals, right? Like getting them externships, getting them people to help them get into veterinary school and, and get those really important experiences early on. And then scholarship as well, because that's super important, especially in our field where that is a really big problem. Um, and lastly, educational outreach. And that includes both for educating our communities, um, since there are language barriers that can sometimes impede getting that information out um, to Spanish speaking clients. And then also for um, our youth, 
which we're trying to inspire more of to get into veterinary medicine and expose them to the opportunities that, um, that are available to them through educational outreach um, in schools. So those are all some of the initiatives we're working on a little at a time, um, but we're really passionate about, about doing all of this um, because we think it'll really make a difference for, for Latinx students. Sure, sure. So I did um, receive a, one question in advance and that question, um, and it was just shortly before, and that question was, how did you come up with the name Latinx? Um, and so certainly as someone that works in uh, diversity and inclusion, Latinx is um, uh, a more recent kind of development in the name, right? It, um, and so uh, there are some senior colleagues who recognize that um, Latin cultures can be very gendered. Um, and so there was kind of a question around like how did, how, how, what was the discussion around um, using Latinx? Who wants to take that? Definitely, I can I can talk a little bit about that, and if, if I do want to add on or anybody else. Um, so, like you said, it's all about inclusivity. Uh, we didn't want to kind of marginalize our, our group to like one specific population or community, right? Um, like I stated before, we want to be as inclusive with uh, people from different genders, uh, from different backgrounds, people that don't even come from our, our culture, but are interested in learning, right? And if we were to define it as Latino or Hispanic, that would totally seclude us from a larger population of the veterinary professionals that are in uh, Canada and the US. So that's including Brazilians and people from Spain. Um, also, what you did mention was that the Latin culture is very genderized. And um, we wanted to give that uh, an open space, a welcoming space for anybody that is wanting to join our community from any gender or sexual orientation um, because we believe that that's important, right? It, one of our goals is to create uh, a community, like a diverse community of accepting everybody. And that is one of the missions that are one of the initiatives that we took to create that mission and, and to make it happen. Um, also there, I know we were talking earlier about uh, what the, the need for the organization uh, and why it's so important. Also, I just wanted to point out that uh, there is a lack of education within, um, I feel like the general public uh, and, and within our community um, about veterinary medicine and people having that language barrier, pet owners, not being able to communicate with uh, veterinarians and client or, and, you know, technicians um, in the way that they feel natural to them or a familiarity with them. Is, um, is very important. So we, we feel like there's a misconception that the Latin, Latin population doesn't really care much about pet health or um, or taking their pets and doing preventatives and, and different surgeries or anything that's needed. And I think that the big lack of problem with that is that there is no education. There's nobody to represent them and having somebody there um, to make them feel like they're, they're included and that there's somewhere that they could totally relate to somebody, right? So um, that's veering out from the land next, but yeah. um, I don't know if you want, if you want to add something regarding how we came up with the name as well. Yeah, so um, I just want to say that there was a lot of debate behind the name um, because I don't think it's something to take lightly when we're creating a representative organization. Um, so we initially were talking about whether we wanted to use the term Hispanic, um, but some folks felt that because not all of um, people from Latin backgrounds speak the language after being born in the US that it would not be inclusive for those veterans or students that don't speak Spanish. So um, that was why we were going with the Latin-esque type name. Um, and then when deciding with Latinx, um, that's a term that is true, is, has been like the younger generations are using. And um, at the end of the day, it was because we are a younger group that is creating the organization. And, you know, we did talk to older professionals and, and they felt that this is a progressive term. And, you know, we're coming, we're starting at a time that is very progressive. And so embracing that was important for us uh, moving forward. Great, thank you, thank you. So um, Carlos, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, about you and your kind of background and kind of how you, how did you come to, to vet med, especially since, uh, yeah, Latinx folks are really underrepresented in the profession. So uh, what's your origin story? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, as all of us, we all have a different history and we have our own different, uh, path that we followed. Um, 
I came to the United States when I was uh, in my freshman year in uh, high school, actually. Um, we had to uh, leave uh, Guatemala very quickly because of political instability, which is an unfortunate but um, continual thing that happens. And uh, because of that, you know, I got here and we, I really didn't know what I was, what was going to happen. So, but ever since I was little, I always wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and that was obviously my, my dream coming to the United States obviously was an additional benefit because the opportunities that are available here uh, in comparison to my own country, at least when, when I came, uh, are incredible. Um, the, uh, I think I might have lost you guys. Oh, you're back. Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, so I was able to utilize the opportunities available to further my career and you know exceed and had some amazing teachers in high school um, that helped me along to be able to get to college, which was the first step. And then uh, really not having anyone to look up to, just kind of had to make my own path to get to to vet school. Um, it took me three times to be able to get in, you know, because it was, it was a challenge. I mean, I was learning English <laughs> at the same time as I was going through undergrad. Yeah, I'd only been, I think I'd only been in the, in the U.S. five years when I first applied. And I really was <laughs> struggling through English and, and all my other courses and trying to succeed in college so I could get to vet school. Um, and then I was finally accepted at the University of Florida, uh, and that was incredible, obviously for me. Uh, my my first dream come true, uh, and you know, so there's been many more since then. You know, I graduated from vet school was you know, obviously my my second dream come true <laughs> because <laughs> you know it's not only hard to get in, but it's also difficult to stay in, and and I did you know face some challenges when I was there. Um, and I uh, ended up having to repeat my first year because I basically was too involved in a lot of things and really did not focus properly on, on what I needed to do and my path and become a veterinarian um, and had to re-challenge re myself to obviously continue to move forward in my path to, to become a veterinarian. Um, and obviously the, uh, the ability to graduate from there after working uh, as hard as I could <laughs> was uh, uh, amazing. And I promised myself that obviously I would try to do as best as I could with the opportunities that were given to me. And life has ama been amazing. Uh, in 2004, I was nominated to uh, get the award as America's favorite veterinarian. And that was incredible. And as a minority veterinarian, to be nominated was just unbelievable, but to actually get the award was incredible. <laughs> Dream three. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, and life is just, you know, giving me so many things. And this country has also given me so many things that the, you know, the least thing that I can do is to give back to the profession and, and to the country. Um, you know, and as, as many things as I can, basically. Um, and helping organize the Latinx VMA, obviously, uh, with this wonderful folks that are here with me uh, and playing the part of mentor uh, is uh, been, you know, dream for, you know, advancing our goals to allow veterinary students, children to have the exposure to, to folks that have succeeded. Um, again, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, and not only, you know, college, but um, high school um, and vet school even, you know, because we're obviously a presence there, but we have no connection. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, um, if, if this group or a, a version of this group had existed back then, how do you think that it would have uh, been a help to you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> just the ability to bounce things off of people. Uh, I mean, having somebody that could speak my language and I could call them up and say, hey, you know, I'm struggling with this. You know, what can I do? Do you have any insight on it? But, 
you know, yeah, we had people that we could talk to, but, you know, it, it's different when it's somebody that, you know, it's similar to you. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that, you know, yeah, until this year, <laughs> that is, you know, there was not the case. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really think that folks underestimate um, the power of connection and shared experience, shared language, um, those types of things. And it's not that those things can't be shared with other folks, but there's something really special and unique about having, um, you know, uh, shared experience, shared culture, shared language, um, just kind of, um, you know, more, even more similarities, right? I think it's just really powerful, especially when we're talking about role modeling. It doesn't mean, again, that other folks can't be role models. It just means that um, it, it really is um, inspiring and encouraging for folks to see someone, to see themselves reflected kind of in the future. Like this is, this could be my future somewhere, you know, down the line. Yeah, yeah. So um, Yvette, who all is on your e-board? Who's leading this charge? So we know that, um, you know, Yvette and, and Wancho are wild and crazy folks went on out there and said, hey, we're going to create this group. Who did you drag along with you? Yeah, so um, I recruited Dr. Campos after <laughs> finding him in an article. Um, and so he is our treasurer. And then um, Rich Elise, she is a uh, classmate of mine um, from Puerto Rico originally. And she is our secretary. She was also on uh, the voice e-board at Cornell with me. So um, we've worked closely together on this. Um, and then obviously Juancho and myself uh, are the e-board. And then we've managed to recruit nine other people to help with initiatives. <laughs> so, um, so that includes veterinary specialists, um, a resident, some other veterinary students, um, a veterinary technician that that um, is really good with website building, and so there, we have a big group of people that are all really passionate about it. And so right now, now that we've grown that group, and and it's interesting, we were able to do this because of COVID, because I haven't been on clinics for the past couple of months, so I had more time to do all of this. Um, but yeah, so we have 13 people all together, and right now we're kind of going through the, the growing pains of figuring out how. To work together and to transition into um, these roles and um, that's that's been pretty exciting. That organizational development and growth piece, right? <laughs> so how will membership work for this group? So um, so are you a membership organization? Are you tell, tell us a little bit about um, about that? Yeah so oh go ahead yeah go ahead okay. yeah so uh, we are going to do membership um, we want to do professional memberships for veterinarians um, within the U.S. and Canada specifically, and then veterinary student memberships as well, um, which would be free for students, and then affiliate memberships for anyone else that's interested, whether that's international veterinarians that want to stay in the loop with us, veterinary technicians, um, yeah, pretty much leaves it open to, to anyone that's wanting to learn more organization um, and so we're hoping to have that established by the end of the year since we're still hacking out the details for that. All right great the, the live book uh, the live book the, um, the live chat on YouTube is lighting up and shouting you all out congratulations good job the event the vet um, is, is <laughs> Uh, is something here that we're seeing. So um, what do you see are the biggest issues that you're hoping to tackle maybe just this year? Like I know that, that clearly is the, it's just kind of really propping up this organization, but what is maybe that number one initiative um, out of those things that you, you mentioned earlier related to the pillars? You know, what of those will you really focus on this year? So um, there, there's a couple, uh, COVID makes it really hard for us to really uh, move forward regarding creating this community in a physical sense. Um, we were definitely doing a lot of background work by creating the executive board, finishing that. And then I think our, one of our next steps is to incorporate as a nonprofit organization. Um, that's something that we're trying to do and create a board of directors as well um, with different titles that would expand the organization and kind of um, expand our ability to do more things like, um, so from our pillars, like find people to collaborate that would provide us funding for scholarships. For example, uh, we're trying to work on creating a director or a directory of uh, professionals, both private and public. Uh, the 
private one would be mostly for members and people that um, are paying a fee to to be part of the organization. The public one would be for any veterinary professional that's interested in having um, kind of their name and where they work in different states or provinces around uh, Canada or, or the US. And that is mostly for our clients and our people that don't necessarily have to pay for membership um, because we want to create that accessibility, right? So I think the building direct directory is probably our primary concern right now uh, because it's one of the biggest initiatives that we're, we're doing and it, it kind of encompasses all of our pillars in one, right? We want to create that, um, that accessibility for clients to be like, okay, I have a, a pet and I need to find the nearest uh, Spanish speaking veterinarian in, in Minnesota or in Wisconsin, and they can go into our, our map and locate somebody um, that, that where those services will be provided. And that way, then we can educate clients and pet owners more, and we will see an influx of Latinx pet owners and, and people that are interested in animal medicine to coming in um, and bringing their pets in pretty much, right? Um, so that's kind of one of our main goals that we want to do uh, right now. I feel like we also eventually want to create um, a conference, an annual conference where we were able to uh, bring everybody in the LVMA together in one spot to celebrate and to network and to do professional development seminars. Um, that is something that I think uh, would be such a fun time because um, let's be honest, the Latino culture is full of dance and <laughs> just like people that just want to like get to know each other. So um, that's, that's also kind of on hold because of COVID. We don't know when the restrictions are going to be uh, lifted in any parts of North America, really. Um, so those are some of the initiatives that we're working on, I know. And um, I know directory is the number one. But yeah, there's, I feel like there's so many things that we're trying to do. Um, I know we, we were trying to uh, accelerate the process for the SAVMA Symposium. Um, that was coming up in Cornell. Obviously, that was going to be our first event that we were going to have a networking um, uh, kind of night for the LVMA, but that had to be canceled due to COVID. So um, we're doing a lot of background work, yeah, as of right now. I don't know if any of you guys want to add anything else, but yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely the directory is going to be a great thing for, for the organization to start up with. Um, you know, as a practice of veterinarian, my clients, you know, that are Spanish speakers are, you know, just enamored that they have somebody that they can talk to. And, you know, I've, I know I told this story multiple times, but, you know, I've had clients that have actually come in and, you know, they, they start crying because they can actually explain to me what's, you know, what's going on, you know, and I can talk to them, you know, just like any, any other person about what we need to do in order to make their, their friend healthy again. Uh, and that's monumental in, in my daily care of my patients. Uh, so given the, the clients that ability to have uh, access to a registry like that, it's going to be, uh, you know, incredible. And obviously it can always expand, you know, it's not only, Spanish is not the only language spoken. <laughs> and I try to be as inclusive as possible in my in my practice, having you know the people that speak multiple languages, and to be able to accommodate for as many people as possible, and that obviously helps with diversity, um, not only in the profession, but you know in the in the groundwork and it's just trying to get the hospitals to be as diverse as possible, and that will permeate into the rest of the profession, I hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Dr. Campos, uh, Carlos, I don't want um, you to, to feel um, unloved. There is a shout out for you in the YouTube <laughs> chat as well from Dr. Uh, Hilda Maya Brew from Michigan State. Um, she just wants to, to say she's so glad that you were a part of this discussion. Um, you have an amazing practice in Florida and uh, all that good stuff. And there's also some wonderful comments here about how inspiring you all are, which you are. So um, so I want to, to start kind of wrapping up a little bit. Um, where, how do folks learn more? Where can they go? Um, so we have social media platforms, uh, which is Latinx Vet on Instagram. And um, our Facebook page is also Latinx Vet. Um, our website is not launched yet. 
but if you follow us, you will get updates on, on when it does launch, and that's info at latinxvma.org. Um, and additionally, if anyone has questions, is interested in being featured on one of our pages, um, you can email us at info, sorry, the website was not info, it's just latinxvma.org, and then the email is info at latinxvma.org. Um, so yeah, you can email us, and we're, we're happy to feature veterinary students, veterinarians, um, and or if you have questions or want to get involved. Um, the other thing too is um, if you're a veterinary student and you're interested in getting a student chapter at your school, you can send us an email and we don't have the program totally put together yet, but we're keeping a, a list of the different students at different schools um, that will then be our contact to get those um, student chapters started. So, so yeah, um, so far we've gotten a lot of support from people. So, so thank you all for, for, for helping us so far. Sure, sure. And uh, one last question that I always ask uh, affinity groups, can non-Latinx folks participate? Mm -hmm. What about us allies? Is there a yeah. role for us in your group? 100%. Um, I think that, that is one of our things that people don't really understand about us, right? And that's just a thing that we really want to get out there, that if you are white, if you are non-Latinx, if you are um, Black, if you are Asian, whatever, but you're interested in learning about our culture, if you're interested in learning about Spanish, how, how you speak Spanish to a client, just because you're moving to an area where it's mostly Latino people or Latinx people, then we can join our group course we will take you with open arms and we will um, help, help you embrace the culture and, and learn about it and, and give you resources to help you um, take that what you've learned to practice and to whatever area of the country you're going to right so um, 100% you don't have to know Spanish uh, at all you can learn Spanish with us hopefully that's one of the initiatives that we want to do um, you don't have to look a certain way you don't have to dress you know like it's just totally inclusive um, and, and we want to make it like that. We, that was our plan from the start. Um, so uh, please, please just reach out to us if you have any questions on getting involved or any interest in, 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 in any of our initiatives. We are more than happy to um, you know, talk with you and, and see where we can take this together, right? Yes, absolutely. I just think that it's really important for folks to understand that um, these affinity groups are not exclusive. It's, they're really inclusive. Just know that when you come into this space, this is really kind of what we're talking about, right? These are issues oh, yeah. that are um, have primacy within this particular population, um, and and that it's not it's not exclusive. It is no. These are this is kind of the things that we're going to focus on. So if you're down with that, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all about like um, you know our our main mission is empowering Latinx excellence in veterinary medicine. If there's anybody that wants to help empower us and 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 lift us up they're more than welcome to do this. So, but knowing that that is the main focus of our organization. And we, we, we like I said, we're with open arms and we, we're open to, um, you know, learning about other cultures as well. Uh, just knowing that it is elevating a specific minority group that has been silenced in the veterinary profession like, for a very long time. And that's why we're here, right? Great, right. awesome. I also wanted to add one thing to that, just for, for anyone that's watching is that, um, being Latinx is an ethnicity, it's not a race. So within our community, we have black, white, brown, we have a little bit of everything. So yes. um, it really is a, a, a celebration of our culture and our backgrounds and you know, anyone is welcome to do that with us. Awesome. Great point. And this is like one of those really important lessons about the difference between race and ethnicity. A lot of times folks think that they're synonyms. They're not the same thing. There's a slash there because, um, because we often talk about both. Um, again, they're separate. Um, race is kind of more phenotypical. Uh, ethnicity is a, a connection by a culture. It may be connection by race, but not necessarily. It may also be connection um, by uh, language. Again, not necessarily, because as, as Wancho mentioned earlier, there are, are um, Portuguese speakers and there's um, folks all around the world um, that have Latin um, ancestry in the diaspora, right? And so um, folks can kind of uh, uh, look different, but have, again, some of those shared um, lived experiences have elements that, that really connect them. And that really is um, kind of what's going on in ethnicity. Yes. So, yeah, go ahead. So um, I also just wanted to point out, we, we are focused on North America as in like US and Canada. I know we get a lot of questions from people from different countries in Latin America that are like, oh, how can I join? 
Um, that is something that we definitely want to do in the future. But right now we're focusing on our community here in US and Canada because we're very much underrepresented. So uh, we, we're building out this foundation, we're building out this organization. And once it's like, has a strong, strong structure and, and there's a strong sense of community, then that's when we can extend our arms and reach out and help um, other communities in Latin America and different parts of the world. Um, but just for those of you that are, you know, are interested or were wondering, um, so we, we are uh, US and Canada only as of right now, but stay tuned because someday we definitely wanna reach out and be a huge resource for the rest of the world. Hey, awesome. So stay tuned. And then one last uh, uh, question for Carlos. What would you like to share and tell your veterinary colleagues out there of all different kinds of backgrounds about the importance, again, of uh, having multilingual staff, but also kind of what role um, folks like you pay, play in the community? Well, I think it's, you know, the most important thing is probably be conscious of um, everything and everybody that's around you. Um, being able to serve uh, different communities is very important. And in order to do that, you have to be part of the community by having representation within your own hospital. Um, like I said, you know, it's not only Spanish, you know, there's Portuguese, there's French, there's Russian. It, it doesn't matter where um, you are practicing, you need to be aware of everybody that's there so that you can be just like we were said to be as veterinarians, you know, part of our community and be leaders within our community also um, by bringing forth, you know, this, this wonderful thing, which is diversity, um, you know, with, and, you know, positive diversity within our community. Great. Thank you so much. So this has been a wonderful, another episode of Diversity and Inclusion on air to my guest, Carlo Wancho Yvette. Thank you so much for taking some time this afternoon to be on the show. It's been fun. Thank you. Thanks for having us. For Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So, you know, down the line and that stay tuned, we'll come back at some point and revisit kind of all the wonderful things that uh, you all are doing out in the community. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. So we're on Stitcher, we're on Apple, we're on all of all of the things. Um, and be sure to also like us on our Facebook page, which is AAVMC's uh, Diversity and Inclusion on Air podcast page on Facebook. So with that, again, to my guests, thank you so much. And thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Gracias. <laughs> Gracias.